All right, take it away, Elizabeth. Welcome to the California Small Farm Conference, everybody. Well, I never say goodbye to the woman this time that I left for a note. Well, I'm up three steps in heaven. Well, on the highway with a hell, and I know it'll be a while before I say goodbye, because I know you're looking well. Hey! It was just my luck to be given the truck with me. Welcome everyone. I'm not sure if those were those slides advancing for folks. Did you guys see the slide? Oh, they weren't. Bummer. Okay. Let me, sorry, let me try to relaunch this. Let's see. We might have to just give up on that. Sorry, everyone. Give me just a second while we. All right, apologies, that's not working right now, I don't think. <laughs> we'll continue um, with our opening presentation, but welcome everyone. Just give me a second here to get our presentation up for folks. Sorry about that technical issue. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, and I'm gonna ask a quick tech question. I'm Ian, um, Evan, for some reason, I can't see any of the Zoom participants when I'm sharing my um, desktop. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but we'll just keep moving forward. Um, hopefully it all is working out, but let me know if something's going on that I may not be aware of. So welcome everyone. This is our award ceremony for the 2022 Innovation Challenge. We are thrilled to have you all here to celebrate um, the awardees with us and to tell you more about the challenge. Um, I wanna first make sure that we thank our sponsors and the folks who helped make this possible for the Innovation Challenge. Um, so this award ceremony is being held as part of the 34th Annual California Small Farms Conference. Um, so I want to thank all the sponsors, all the partners who have helped make this possible. We also um, had a very special sponsorship from the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources and the Vine um, Collaborative to help bring some cash prizes um, to this year's champion. So wanted to acknowledge them and also special thank you to Johnny's Selected Seeds. Um, they were able to donate gift cards and an awesome new tool um, to the winners of this innovation challenge. Uh, so a brief overview of how our program is going to be laid out for, for everyone in attendance. We're going to do a brief intro to what the Small Farm Innovation Challenge is. We're going to do the award ceremony um, followed by the innovation presentation so you can learn more about these innovations um, and what they are and why they, they rose to the top out of all the applicants we received. Um, and then that's going to be followed by a question and answer discussion between you, the audience attendees, 
any judges who we have in attendance as well, and the awardees. Um, and also if the awardees wanna ask each other questions, um, this will be a discussion period at the end for us all to do that. If questions are coming up for you as you hear the innovation presentations, please feel free to go ahead and drop those in the Q&A or the chat box. And we'll add that to the lineup for that portion of the program. So why is this challenge so important? Um, tools and technology can help farmers improve efficiency, save, save labor, and connect with their customers. Um, but many of the innovations in agriculture today are being built for large scale production, which is out of reach for most family farms, all while contributing to ecological degradation and yet more consolidation in the industry, perpetuating a vicious cycle. So coupled with get big or get out ideology, it would seem that technology has left smaller farms behind, all to the detriment of rural economies, social equity, and even the health sustainability and quality of our food. But does it have to be this way? So that's why the innovation challenge was launched. It's to get at some of these big questions like tech sovereignty, who controls the data that's being produced today by our small farm? What's the right to repair with some of our tractors and access to other appropriate tools? And farmers around the world carry a huge swath of knowledge and innovation. So let's raise that up and bring it to the table. And let's use our collective knowledge to build back better. Uh, right now, the USDA is investing over $4 billion to strengthen our local food system. Um, so CAF is looking forward to contributing to that discussion and bringing small farmers a bigger voice in regards to innovation around these technologies. Um, here's something to highlight another reason why this is so important and also why this innovation challenge is a global competition. Small farms and landholders across the world are facing similar responses. Um, in case folks didn't see this news headline come out last September, this was a global response and boycott which occurred at the UN Food Summit um, in September. Um, and as more investment is made in ag technologies, we aim to make sure the small farm is not left behind with a seat at the table instead of being on the table. Farmers across the world have been speaking up on this issue, and this is just highlighting some of that work that farmers have been doing. So with the Small Farm Innovation Challenge, we hope to add fuel to this effort and provide a platform for strengthening food and tech sovereignty for the small farm. So this brings us to the Innovation Challenge. Um, I wanted to highlight the winner of last the last innovation challenge, which occurred in 2019, um, which was the farmhand tractor. Um, he has made his innovation into a business reality, um, was selected as part of the 2021 cohort for the business accelerator program, Food System 6. Um, and he's been doing great with um, taking that momentum from the innovation challenge. And I want to highlight a fun video of his that he put together.
right. Go Farmer Dave. Um, so he may be able to join us today. I'm not sure. Maybe for the discussion period, if anyone has um, questions for his winning innovation. I um, wanted to highlight the judges of this year's Small Farm Innovation Challenge and thank you and thank them for their time and effort reviewing all the applications we received. Um, here's a list of all the judges that were participating on this year's selection committee. Um, and we also have a fun video note from one of them. Hi, this is Perry Kramer from Food System 6. I just wanted to congratulate all the winners of the um, of CAF Small Farm Innovation uh, Challenge. It was a pleasure to be on the um, committee to review all of the um, applicants. And um, there were so many interesting, fabulous innovations that were put forward. And um, congratulations to the winners. So I'm excited to see what, um, what the next steps are with all of these fun projects. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Perry. And so a quick note too, we are seeking judges um, for this upcoming innovation challenge that we'll be holding again with the application portal opening this summer. Um, so just wanted to do a call out if you know of anyone or if anyone's on today's uh, session who is interested in joining, please reach out to me. I'll put a link to our website and a form that we have for you to submit your interest. Um, but yeah, we would love to just help you, have you help spread the word. So thank you in advance for doing that. Excited to see what comes next. All right, so we're moving on um, to our innovation winners. Uh, so we have three winners for this uh, competition we, and we have the best do-it-yourself innovation for the small farm. Um, and this is presented to the No Dig Removable Impost. Um, the innovators are Kyle Farmer and Brian Kierzan, apologies if I'm missing your name, with um, McGruger Ranch and the, the cattle rancher um, and the ranch hand there. Um, so I'd like to give them a round of applause. Good job. And do we have Kyle on um, right now? I can't see the panelists. I'm not sure if he's been able to get on. Yeah, yes, I am on. Awesome, Kyle, would you like to accept your award? Um, say a few words, maybe. Um, I thought, are, are we gonna show that video or is that me saying a few words or say a yeah, few yeah. words? Yeah, yeah, yes, we're gonna play your video right after this. Yeah. So just wanted to give you a oh. moment to say thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, did not, just was hoping that at least the judges, if not, if there were the other, this was going to get posted someplace. Maybe a few people would see it and save themselves a little time building fence. But um, happy to happy to have received the award. Awesome! Thank you, Kyle. All right, now we'll play his video so you can learn more about this item. And Kyle will also be av available for the discussion at the end if you have questions for him. You feel like you've been doing nothing but digging holes for your impost since you were five years old? Damn. I want to show you a better way that I figured out how to do this job. What do you think, Walter? Good. Yeah. I'm Bryce Crejean, and I'm Kyle Farmer. Thank you for recognizing and awarding us for our no-dig removable impost. So why would you want to build a no-dig removable impost? Let me start with why you might not want to. Um, I think if you've got access to your own wood, first of all, you are really cool. If you're able to, you know, you got some black locusts growing or maybe you got some lodgepole pines growing and you're, you know, cutting your own lumber and building your own fences with it, that's way better. Um, maybe also uh, you don't have good access to um, Maybe you don't have good access to U Channel here. Um, here in wine country, these are pretty common uh, in posts. They actually don't do a brace on them, but they've got them at the end holding up 14 gauge wire. Um, but maybe you're in some part of the country I've never been to, and uh, 
and you don't have access to these to the U channel. They're also known as highway stakes, so you might be able to find them that way. I know you can get them on online as well. Um, maybe they're 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 really expensive at that point. So it's really you're relying on access to U channel. Um, but other than that, I'd say it's the best kind of post I've ever built. Um, Bryce and I have built H braces together. Um, your standard H braces. I mean, if you're leasing land, it's going to be near the landowner's house. Maybe that's a that's the one to build. It's a nice looking end post. We designed this end post concept iteratively. Never, we never sat down and said, you know, how are we going to figure out the best end post to build? Um, it's a it's a modification of every end post design I've ever seen. And ultimately, the reason um, I think it works is I can't figure out a way to make it any simpler. I think if you look at something and you're like, ah, that's about as simple as it can get, um, you might be onto something. So the biggest advantage to this post design is simply the speed of installation. At the end of this video, you'll see Bryce and I uh, build an in, in post um, from start to finish in two and a half minutes. Um, maybe somebody can do that with, with an H-brace, but it's not me. Another advantage of this design is it can be installed in winter when you might have uh, better, better opportunities to do that kind of work. The biggest, no, biggest is the speed. Um, another great uh, aspect of this post design is that you can do a lot of the work for the impost in the shop. We'll show you um, just the basic build of the notch. It's kind of thing you can probably look at it and figure out yourself, but might as well. And doing that in the shop, in the shade, um, out of the rain, at night, after you put your kids to bed, you know, it just really works with a rancher's workflow to be able to get those imposts built before you're out in the field. Um, so you can really just put out a bunch of fence when you're, when you're in the field building fence.
it comes to gates, I'm sure there's a, a better way than what I figured out so far, but what I've been doing is a fiberglass rod with pre-drilled holes. Take some of your electric netting that's already fallen apart and find some good pieces out of it. You've got yourself a gate. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Kyle, for putting together that amazing video. We already got some questions coming through um, from folks wanting more information. So um, we'll hold those for the discussion period or Kyle, feel free to type out some answers live or we'll follow up with people with the answers to those questions if we can't get to them. Um, all right. So moving on, um, our next prize goes to the most innovative software for the small farm awarded to Harvest Path. Um, oh, sorry for the name for Richard and Carrie Richards um, with with uh, Richard's grass-fed beef. Um, so congratulations to, to you all. We also are able to get them a cash prize with the Johnny Seeds um, gift card. Um, and we'll now hear a presentation from what Harvest Path is. All right. Um, thank, oh, thanks so much, Elizabeth. And thank you so much for Really honored and excited to be chosen for the uh, uh, you know, Innovation Award. And what we're gonna talk about today, uh, both my sister and I, so my name's Tom Richards, my sister Carrie Richards is, okay. is on with us. And we're gonna kind of go back and forth as we talk about um, our, our uh, software solution that we call Harvest Path. Um, um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carrie real quick and we're gonna play a video. We have 6,500 acres. We have probably holistically grazed just under a thousand of it. Uh, since we have focused more on ranching regeneratively, the pastures and the riparian areas seem to be healing themselves. The soil's taking on more water, holding more water, and we don't have irrigation. So seeing all this wavy grass in almost July is so exciting. <laughs> I'm really trying all the stops to get the animals themselves to be more resilient and the land itself. And I think it, obviously it's all connected. The principles that we are focusing on on our grazing plan, consolidating the animals, so more animals in a smaller area, densing them up to about 50 animals per acre. They are gonna dung and urine, which is gonna fertilize. Take half and then they trample half, so it could go back into the soil. Bring in the sheep right behind the cattle. If you're moving them through the pasture quick enough, you can break the parasite cycle. We wanna make sure to give our pastures the right amount of rest. We don't wanna go back in too soon and overgraze. I'm excited to be a part of a business selling meat that I would feed my family any day of the week. I would tell other families to buy it and I can stand behind it wholeheartedly. And now that I know more about soil and that I can use my animals to actually improve the soil and not like cause further harm to the earth, I feel like I have found exactly where I need to be. Yeah, if you could go to the next slide, that'd be awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. That was just a little video kind of about our business and how we operate on our ranch. Um, the software that we've developed, basically, um, we started it because of our certifications and we needed to track those animals and we need to make sure that they were being fed only grass, and we had to be able to prove that to our certifiers when we first joined uh, American Grass Fed back in 2012. So that was the original reason why we started Harvest Path was so that we could prove um, to those that we were selling to that we were practicing uh, what we preached. And um, so anyway, it started there. And then eventually we moved on to taking on the uh, land to market verification 
which does um, water infiltration and carbon measurements on a yearly basis. And so now we are using our software system to track animals that are also from that um, certification so that we can make sure everybody that we buy from is following the rules um, of these two certifications, as well as we're gonna start uh, tracking our data that we get from uh, land and market as well. We can go to the next slide. <laughs> so, um... So that's how we got started with, or the reason we kind of started trying to figure out how to track all of these records. And, you know, instead of doing it the traditional way of, you know, a piece of paper nailed to the uh, barn door, we, we decided to, to do, you know, to create our own technology because there really wasn't anything out there. And what we first started with was tracking animal records, was all of the birth records, tagging, you know, grouping them into herds, locations, audits, you know, all these kinds of things. Once we really started to get a handle on that, we realized we had to kind of move to the next step, which was when it's time to harvest them, you know, how do we group them? How do we track the whole harvest process, you know, all the way from, from shipping to the actual harvest to the yields and all those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden, once we had done that, we realized, wow, you know, we should track inventory. And so we kind of just went, we just kept going through the entire process until we had created, you know, a single application that tracks all of these things that you can see um, on the slide here. So, so in addition to the animals and harvest, we do all of our inventory, all of our sales. Um, we also track any further fabrication. So any, you know, creation of bricks or other CPG related products. The best thing, um, in my opinion, about what we've done is actually at the end of the day, the reporting. Because when we really want to figure out what's going on, we're able to run all sorts of reports and dashboards and, and look at the data in, in so many different ways, which really helps us uh, do analysis on the business. And so um, it's been very helpful for our business and then we're actually gonna be doing some more things too, which I'll let um, Carrie talk about really quick on the coming soon. <laughs> yeah, so on the ranch side, I track the animals um, as well as other animals that we have on other properties. And so the feature I use the most is the herd membership um, because there's different categories of animals. You have calves, you have mother cows, you have finishers. So I track them all in herds and make sure um, to track the supplementation for each herd and the location and the costs that are associated with each herd group. So that's been really helpful for me. It's a lot of data, I realize, um, and I've been using less and less of the individual animal data and more of the herd data because we are growing, um, but all that individual animal data is in there. So this is just a little screenshot of what an individual animal uh, data sheet looks like, and it's just part of it, and then what a herd membership looks like. So this animal was a part of the finishing herd, and they were rounded up on a couple different dates, and then they were given these vaccinations. So um, it's a really helpful tool on the ranch side. Okay, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, and then just a little bit more, actually, go if you can go back one slide real quick. I was just gonna talk a little bit more about, whoops, the other direction. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. 18, there you go. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, the harvest process, right? So, um, you know, what we, we, we enabled was a way to put to group, uh, to create groups of animals and basically attach them to an, a data object that we call a harvest or a harvest lot. And then at the, what's really beneficial about that is we're able to see the individual animal yields, but we're also be able to roll that up at kind of a harvest lot level to see things like average carcass weight, you know, um, the yields, not just in terms of from the live animal to the box beef, but also to from live to, or sort of live to carcass, but also live to box beef. And then we're able to translate that all the way down to individual products 
individual pricing, individual cost per product. So the harvest lot, you know, is connected to the inventory item and that's connected to the costing and pricing and the products. And so th this was probably the, the most complicated piece that we built, but, um, but it's been the, the most invaluable in terms of the data that it provides to us. And then uh, if you can go to the next slide, Elizabeth. So this is just a, a sample of some dashboard or, or a dashboard that we created. And this was really um, to track um, harvest yields. And so, you know, numbers of cattle, average live weight, um, average price, you know, all these different kinds of things as well as numbers from each ranch. And then, and this is just a sample. We have, we have probably a hundred dashboards that we use on a daily basis to track everything from yields and sales and uh, product uh, inventory issues and things like that. So um, it's been very, very helpful. And then we'll go to the, I think this is our last slide. And so just to give you a very simple idea of the, the pieces of the supply chain that, that we've created, the green uh, bars here is the stuff that um, that we built inside of uh, our application. And, I, and if I didn't mention this, we built this on the Salesforce platform. And um, so the animals and stuff you heard Carrie talk about, the harvest lot process I spoke about, um, there's a portion of that once it gets to the processor that we, that we lose a little bit of transparency, but we track that manually. And then the distribution and sales. And then on the other end, on the beginning end, um, the part we're working on now is the soil piece and the ability to track individual pastures, soil um, uh, test sites, and then you know mapping of that and then how that passes into the animal, which passes into the end product. And then um, on the end side is like delivery and all those kinds of things, which we have not done. And we rely on other um, um, capabilities to do that. Um, so this kind of gives you a, a single picture of, of what we've done um, in, in total. And then- yeah, In the spare time that we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm excited about the soil piece. Um, I don't you know, know how many farmers and ranchers there are here on this call, but um, when you get those awesome sheets um, from different people that do the measuring for you, or if you do it yourself, sometimes it's hard to think of like, okay, how do I take this data and then explain it to our customers? So the, the new soil piece that we're trying to add, I'm really excited about. And then we just, we threw this slide in there um, you know, talking about how regenerative is a food trend and with our software, we're able to track all of our animals coming from all the different ranches that are EOV certified. And so we were able to take advantage of that new market trend that, um, everyone's really excited about, but we obviously don't want to greenwash and we want to make sure that like everybody is still, um, excited about it moving forward and wanting to use their animals to take care of the earth. So, um, Thank you. And if there's any questions, just let us know. And hopefully that was an exciting software presentation. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you to you both. That was great. Um, yeah. And just congratulations again on being our winner for the most innovative software. Uh, all right, moving on. So we got our most innovative hardware award for the small farm that goes to a company coming out of Australia, the Handy. Um, well, the name's Curly Yag of the company, apologies, but the innovation is called Handy, which we'll learn about that in a minute. Um, but want to just congratulate these folks for being one of our winners as well. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Heath, for the... Thanks Heath for the, um, the award, I appreciate it. It's been a lot of hard work and um, yeah, appreciate the recognition. Great, awesome. So let's learn more about the handy. Hi, I'm Curly and this is Curly's Ag.
Awesome. That music gets me every time. Well done. <laughs> Hi, I'm Curly. And this. All right, going on to is our Curly's app. App. I can do this. Come on. Those guys, for some reason, that video is not. Hey, Elizabeth. Yep. Could I just say a couple of words on it now the video's played? Oh, uh, at the maybe for the discussion period. Yeah. I want to make okay. sure we have time for everyone, if that's okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, on to the next uh, award E. Um, so this uh, wasn't, we had three winners allocated for the innovation challenge this year, um, but we had to bring a note to this innovation that was submitted because the judges across the board found this um, most ratings for the most economically beneficial, the most practical um, for, for small farmers and especially with livestock um, producers. So we wanted to present this um, most economically beneficial, sorry, my, the, some of these typos, beneficial innovation is presented to the Livestock Yield and Pricing Margin Tool. Um, so I wanted to congratulate them. Um, so we're having, <laughs> we're having the award received um, by one of their users of the tool actually, uh, Zach with Campfire Farms. Um, and I'll let him share a few words, um, but he is accepting this on behalf of the innovators who are based in Europe, um, so they're not able to join today. Um, but Zach, would you mind sharing a few words? Sure, yeah, happy to be here. As, as Elizabeth said, I had nothing to do with the creation of this award, but I'm happy to be here taking all the credit. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, and we're excited to have you a part of the discussion as well, if there's more follow-up questions on how this tool works. All right, yeah. so let's watch, oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, so we'll now watch a video um, with uh, Olivia giving a demonstration and presentation on this tool. Hi, my name is Olivia Tinkani, and I'm excited to be here today from afar um, accepting our award for the Tech Innovation Challenge for our Livestock Yield Margin and Growth profit calculator. So I'm an independent consultant and educator and I work um, with farms and ranches and nonprofits to execute training programs for farmers and ranchers and also work one on one with producers. And my partner in crime is Bernoulli Finance, a full financial services firm that assists mission positive ventures with financial planning, analytics and operations. And their clients span multiple sectors, but they have a focus in food and farming as well. And as you can suspect, they are also Excel ninjas. And we work together to design curriculum, teach courses, act as a strategy and financial team of advisors for multiple organizations and producers. So over many years of working with multiple livestock producers, I realized we were looking for and always encouraging a level of analysis in all sorts of places through multiple tools and styles of analysis and platforms. And so the goal to create this calculator was to marry multiple needs, um, encourage harvest record keeping, which is the bane of everybody's existence, to join it with yield and carcass analysis and important metrics, something that many folks do once in a while and then forget about or do on a hypothetical best performing animal and never look at their actual carcass performance in a frequent, frequently done yield tree. Um, I also wanted to have a home to calculate production and post-production or processing costs that feed into COGS or cost of goods sold um, on a harvest by harvest basis to help calculate what that true COGS is on the meat um, that they are producing. We also always want to calculate a per cup margin um, to understand and be able to analyze what every cut gets, gets you back in your pocket and have a place to experiment with different pricing matrixes alongside different carcass cutouts to determine where your best options are for your breakdown. And fold all that up into determining your overall great gross profit based on actual sales channels that you use, either direct consumer or wholesale, and see what that final nut actually produces. So this is a big tool, and we made it for pig, beef, lamb or goat, chicken, turkey, and there's blank templates for additional poultry and additional ruminants. And who is this for? Um, individual farmers and ranchers. Ideally, somebody's helping those producers actually use this tool, but not necessarily for folks that are somewhat familiar with Excel. 
And it was born out of an independent, um, a different tool built for the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance, which is a nonprofit group of farmers and ranchers, conservationists, chefs, uh, researchers working together to promote grass-fed livestock production and supply chain in the Southeast. And our easier tool was a part of a whole series of business trainings um, that uh, we produced for the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance. You can go check out their stuff online. Uh, and from there, we birthed this very large, more complex tool, and we've been using it in other incubator and accelerator settings and licensing it to nonprofit organizations and also individual farmers and ranchers to use for themselves and their operations. So I'm going to share my screen and give a really breezy overview. So we're gonna start here on this tab, which is a direct production, a uh, place to record our direct production costs. We record all of them for the whole year and then scroll down to the bottom and put the number of animals that you're raising for the year. And this gives you an average per cost per animal that uh, feeds directly into the rest of the tool. <clears throat> and then over here on our harvest log, we've got uh, essentially the power of the tool is the date range that we're putting in up at the top. And so harvests are recorded across time in different columns and uh, we do so by date. And then we can scroll down here to start to enter the fees that we pay um, every time we process an animal per head and per pound. So processing fees, transport fees, these are all our post-production costs. We put in the number of head that we harvest, our live weight, our hot carcass weight, and we can divide our harvest by those that we do cut and wrap for or those that we do whole carcasses for. And then we record all of the cuts that we get back from the processing if we're doing cut and wrap, um, separated by primals and totaled by primals. And it includes everything uh, like trim and grind and the fab drop, so fat and skin and bones and even the slaughter drop. So once we've got all of our cuts entered for every breakdown, we come back up here and we say some nice um, metrics that we look at after we've entered in our whole cutout. So the regular ones that we're used to looking at, like uh, hot carcass and live weight shrink, but we've also got some more interesting things that are often ignored, like sellable products, which is actually your fat and bones and all of your cuts and your red meat meal and your red meat yield. So these are things that people are looking at a little bit less frequently. Um, and these are, we're, we're actually showing the total of pounds for harvest and then we're looking at some percentages up at the top and we're starting to look at the costs that go into each harvest and a total, uh, a total per harvest amount. So what we're doing here is we're starting to look at some areas for our own in our own enterprises, our own organizations, where our personal benchmark gets set um, by looking across all of these different harvest groups, right? So now we're going to jump over to the next tab, which is called the COGS calculator. And you'll see that now we're starting to look at at numbers over time. So up here, we're powering by dates. We put in our dates uh, on a different tab and get a date range that we want to be analyzing for. And we're looking at, you know, ideally percentages across maybe the whole year or a quarter or two years to start to evaluate your operation. So our metrics here are average per head, right? And uh, in terms of pounds, uh, live weight, hot carcass weight, sellable product, all these, these jazzy, these jazzy metrics that we want to get out of our, our larger time-based look, and also our total pounds and our significant ratio still here in percentage. And then down in this section, we've got all of our cuts that we've entered in on the prior page and our per cut unit cost. Up here at the top, these are our, our major uh, per head averages for all of our costs, and it calculates us our true 
average cost per pound of sellable product, which feeds directly into our margin calculator page. So our margin calculator page is, is the main functionality is give us a place where we can show the margin on each whole or half or quarter or each cut by entering in pricing for our various different sales channels. There's a direct to consumer channel that you're entering your pricing and it, it immediately spits out your farm margin. And we've got two channels for, for wholesale as well. So if you have different pricing and two different wholesale channels. And lastly, this all gets rolled up into our animal summary page where we're, we can look at all the different species that we've got here. <clears throat> and most importantly, look at our gross profit that's coming out of the animals. So we've got, we power our date range up here at the top and we've got our animals split out into those we cut into carcasses and those we cut into full we'll cut and wrap breakdown. <clears throat> we assign those animals to different sales channels up here, either DTC or wholesale. And it tells us exactly how much we're spending in this state range on all these harvests on all these animals per head and per pound an actual total dollar amount for the number of animals that are selected in this state range. Then we've got our revenue and our gross margin, right? Our revenue less our COG. In, in per head, per pound, total dollar amount and percentage. So essentially, you know, this is just as important to be looking at across as a, a date range, actually more important than a single animal to see how much profit you actually have that goes back to ranch operations, right? So our gross margin is then what goes to power the, the farm and ranch itself after all of our cost of production and processing. So this is the crux of the tool, right? A holistic per head average for calculating that gross profitability per animal unit to complement all of your other accounting analysis. We can keep a hypothetical version of this tool um, and record single animal harvest and average cutout and with different cutout styles to investigate what gets you the most profit of those cutout styles on a per head basis. We can also change the number of animals that go through these, these different sales channels here. How many, if I can, if I sell nine to DTC and one to wholesale or nine to wholesale and one to DCTC, what happens? We can compare whole carcasses versus cuts. And the point is to really make decisions based on your averages, your own benchmarks, not based on what comes off of one exceptional animal or one or some USDA average for dressing percentages, or you know the last time you recorded how much feed cost you per pound that you actually harvested. So the important thing is that you know what your operation does over time. And that's why we built this tool so that you have a place to start to record all of that. All of that. So please uh, be in touch if you're interested in looking at our, our calculator. We'd love to share it with you. We're still testing it out uh, in the sense that we've got a number of producers using it, but we're always gathering feedback from more users. And thanks again to CAF for powering this conference and this challenge. Awesome. All right. So that concludes all the winners that um, won this year's innovation challenge. So I want to do another round of applause for everyone for their winning innovation. Yay. <laughs> so congrats again. Um, we're thrilled to bring this platform to all of you. Um, and I also wanted to make a note on our top finalists who, um, you know, didn't quite get the highest score, but they really were close. Um, so wanted to give a shout out to Open Food Network. Um, I believe Lori is on the webinar uh, today. We have multi the multi-purpose pasture pen. Um, this person's written a book and it's a really great innovative um, pasture pen idea that he submitted for the innovation. Um, and then Eco Life Companies, which is actually coming out of Uganda. They developed like a cold storage uh, building that was really innovative. Um, so all of these we plan to highlight on our website and through CAF's blog. Uh, so keep an eye out for all the videos and images and, and fun applications that we think can benefit many other people. So congrats again. Um, I wanna, before we get into the discussion period um, between the awardees, also the audience, anyone else who's on the session today, I just wanna do another thank you to our sponsors 
Um, again, we were able to provide those cash prizes to this year's winners, which we're really grateful for. Um, and that was through the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources and the Vine. So just want to thank them again and for Johnny's Seeds also for providing gift cards and a tool to all the winners. So thank you to our sponsors and also for the all the small farm conference sponsors for helping making this possible. All right, so this is our Q&A discussion period. Uh, we have about 15 minutes or so. Um, so I wanted to give time for audience members to ask questions, for awardees to ask questions of each other. Um, and Curly, I believe you really wanted to share some words on your innovation, maybe before we dig in. So I'll give you a second to share what you would like yeah. to. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. No, I just, the presentation I presented was basically an explainer of what we are and who we do. I just want to quickly mention where to from here. Um, and, and we've got big hopes and ambitions to, to be able to, to create um, further technologies, further implements. Um, we've already got on the drawing board, quick cut, like a, like a greens harvester, you know, stuff for cradles and moving cattle around like um, sheep and stuff. Um, you know, an electric post driver for um, Kyle, uh, for example, that you can plug into the handy. Um, this is auxiliary power unit and then also we want to do uh we want to head into the into the autonomous scenery um and work in fleet capacity to be able to do um anything that bigger tractors do as opposed to doing one big unit to several smaller units that uh, work between each other to um to 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 do the same job effectively so yeah we're 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 working hard on that and if anyone um thinks that they could help out either with their skill set or financially, that'd be that'd be great to hear from. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we'll continue with the discussion period. I know, um, Kyle, people were asking, you know, about the post driver and electric jackhammer that's needed. Um, so it looks like two folks were asking about that. They asked if they needed an electric jackhammer to do your your no dig in post, and then the post they asked more information about the post driver tool from another person. Yeah, I you know I I wish it I wish that you could build that without any extra tools, but it's certainly um, that's certainly key to the design is that you need that um, automatic uh, T post driver. Then there's a secondary attachment. Um, I wish if I had thought about it, I would have remembered which one I bought, but I got a really good deal on one that had been on the shop floor of, or like a demo. It had been the demo model um, for a year of of showing around the country. Um, you know, I, I would highly suggest if you're building very much fence um, for the sake of your body to consider buying a, an automatic post pounder. Um, you know, it, it, it hits it, you know, several hundred times a minute instead of you having to do it with your wrists. And it's, it's just, it's a, the T-post pounder is a terrible tool for the human body. It's just, they don't integrate well together. Your body literally just absorbs the impact is, is the way the energy works. So one of those post pounders, if, if you're gonna build, um, you know, put in more than a hundred T-posts in, in the lifespan of a, T, of, a, of, a, of a post pounder, I'd recommend buying one just for the sake of your own um, health cost in the long run. Um, we actually, we have a, a, a trailer that holds three rolls of electric wire, all the tools you need to put it out holds the posts on the top and then two different types of posts on the side and then have the place to hold that ponder. And you can drive out five strands simultaneously while putting in fence. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it, it does require, you know, a thousand dollar outlay in, uh, in capital to be able to build fence that way, but it's, it seems worth it to me. To me, the alternative is a good deer and a, and a postal digger or a handy and the post hole digger on that guy. Um, and like, like, like he said, I, I've thought a lot about that. Um, you know, if I could hook, I was actually talking to a battery chemist um, just this morning um, about how I would rather have, you know, an electric side-by-side -side or a handy and then use plug-in tools off of that big battery um, than have all these small batteries that seem like they're constantly going bad. So I, I, I really, I'm excited for my handy one of these days. We actually have incorporated into the handy 
um, on the front of the right hand side, there's an APU output, which we hook all our powered equipment onto. And, um, and that's driven from its motor control, which the handy has incorporated in the inside of the electrical box. And basically we've got a whole series of just dumb electrical tools from water pumps to, you know, post drive and stuff planned for it because it, it essentially, it, and you can even run 240 volt power tools off it because of the amount of battery that it just holds on it. Um, you use whatever you want and just have a cable from the head of that, you know, and then drop it on and then do your thing. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for answering that. And then um, since this is recorded, the chat won't be um, visible. So I just want to make sure that we know that the handy sounds like it will be available in the US shortly. So congrats on that. It's already, um, sorry, we've already um, sent, we've got two orders coming from the handy in the US. Um, they're actually behind me. You can see that's one there. It's almost ready to go. And there's one, this one here is the other one ready to go to the US. So hopefully we can get them in a container this month or early next month and they'll be on their way. Awesome, congrats on that. Um, I know there's a big livestock focus too for the innovation winners for this year. So Zach, I was kind of curious with some of these bigger investment type you know, equipment items that are being highlighted. It sounds like this tool is able to save just farmers time and figure out where your cost savings are or what, how much gross, you know, what your gross margins are to then invest maybe in future business, you know, expenses. So curious to just hear more on how the tool benefited you. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's, um, it's given us confidence in our pricing for sure. Um, and uh, I think, and, and so that works both ways. Like we, uh, the prices that we set, we're, we're confident that, you know, we're, we're covering all of our costs and we can also avoid wholesale relationships that are not profitable um, because, of, because of that confidence. Um, it's also pretty easy to, like I've trained employees on it and there uh, it's no longer, you know, we used to have a system where they would basically like text me yield numbers as they weigh them, as they check them in off uh, from the processor. We don't get like a great production report from our processor. We have to like weigh things on, back at the farm. Um, but um, yeah, and, like since we're using this tool, I've just kind of given them the, give our employees the keys to the tool and, and I, it's totally hands off for me now. So yeah, it saved me a ton of time. Yeah, it certainly seems like, especially if you're transitioning uh, in frame size approaches to ranching, like it's really hard to keep consistent ideas about how you're doing if you're, you know, reducing the frame size of some of your animals. Um, you know, it may have been a good idea, it may not be a good idea, but if all you're seeing is how much they weigh, um, I'm sure Carrie too, convincing anybody to work with you and they're seeing their, their overall you know, weight go down, but maybe their yield numbers are going up. Um, that's a great tool to be able to see if things are working as you get more sustainable, which in my opinion, often means a reduction in frame size in terms of cattle. Absolutely, and, you know, and as we, we scaled up during COVID, um, things got to be, you know, there was just a, an abundance of data um, and we're, we're, we're ha happy to be able to use it and, and we have that historical record now. Um, so uh, yeah, no, it's, it's really been fantastic for it. Awesome. Yeah. And so anyone else, if you want to post any questions in the chat or the Q&A box, please feel free to. We can also take you off mute if you want to raise your hand. Um, I did want to welcome one of our other judges. I hope I'm not putting her on the spot, but I wanted to make note that Hannah is joining us. Um, uh, thank you, Hannah, for serving as a judge for this year and wanted to give you a chance to, to say any note of congratulations or any feedback or any words you'd like to to our awardees. Yeah, no, um, I was just blown away by the um, amazing diversity of different applications that we got in and the wide variety of creative solutions that different um, teams thought of. Um, I'm really excited to see the future of this innovation challenge as well. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I was really excited to be part of it. And um, thank you all for contributing your great innovations. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Any of the awardees want to ask each other any questions? I know it's always like, you know, nice to hear what's your next steps. What's what are you looking for um, for the next step for your innovation or for connecting to other to other partners? We'd love to hear from you all on that. Um, but if there's any other questions too that come up, please feel free to ask away. I've got a question for the Richards team. Um, 
is it, uh, how would one access this? It, it sounds like you've, this is like a custom application that y'all built. Is this something that the public has access to or you do you have plans for that? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Zach. So it is proprietary to us right now, um, but we are actually in conversations to make it publicly available. Uh, and TBD on that, I don't know, we don't have a date on that yet, unfortunately. That's great. Another, just a quick follow up on that. Any plans? It sounds like it. I mean, to me, there are some applications on the pro, the processor side of things too. Is that has that come across your desk? Just just occurred to me just now. Yeah, um, I think my dog wanted to ask answer that question. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's there's actually a few more steps in the process um, that we're we're looking at building, and one is the processor piece. Um, we don't own and manage our own processing facility, so um, we're, we're going to have to find a partner to do that. And that's why we're, that's kind of why we're prioritizing the soil piece first. But, um, but yeah, we, it, you know, there's, as you know, right, there's a, there's multi steps in the, in the chain. And uh, for now, what we've done is the harvest uh, object that we created enables us to track a lot of that data that we get back from the processor. Um, in the future, ideally, it would be the processor who enters that, right? In, in that step, and then we just get access to the data. So that's, um, that's also a, a TBD in the step. Um, actually, if I can ask a quick question. So uh, Zach, and I think it was Olivia, right? Who did the, the demonstration, <clears throat> I think we, you know, for a, for a later date, love to talk with you guys because I think there is a lot of crossover between what we've done and what you guys done have done. So I think it'd be great to um, to touch base. Yeah, I'm happy to connect you with Olivia and her team, and and yeah, I, I'll, I'll contribute however I however I can. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. I think the the uh, back to your soil testing bit too. I mean, I think that that is critically important and and. Uh, you know, as we're all wondering what our climate impact is in agriculture, you know, I think that if there's a way that you could integrate that in a, at a really high level of confidence, I would love to see that. I'm a agronomist on the side, and and uh, it's a uh, uh, un, miss, uh, a poorly understood part of what we're all doing. I'd say. Well, I, I I completely agree with you, and I think the other the other piece of it is it's one thing to have the data right. Um, but it's the another thing to be able to take that data and link it all the way back to the in, individual animal. And then also what uh, paddock or what dirt, you know, that animal was on. And then you then you really know, right, you know, the 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 animal that was on, you know, such and such paddock, you know, that was super, super healthy. And then it's this high yielding animal. And you know, over time. Um, you know, we've started to see, we've, we've started to be able to make that link to the animals. And then that, that next step is where the real science is, right, in the soil. I, and Carrie, I know you're probably dying to comment on that too. Um, yeah, everything he said, but a lot of it, a lot of it is we need, um, I keep saying like a spider web to throw all this uh, monitoring data into so that we can start running some equations on what this data really means. Cause I, 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 maybe you guys do too, but we get monitoring done by multiple uh, organizations. So we'd like to not only put that all together, pull it all together, but also compare the data and see if they're all saying the same, if they're all pointing in the same direction. Um, because some data looks better than others and some pastures look better than others. And so if we can really look down to the nitty gritty of that and then we can make some management decisions and also purchasing decisions. Yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. I can connect you with some folks that are doing some pretty innovative stuff on the soil testing, plant sap analysis side of things too. So um, yeah, but let's, let's connect. One, sorry, one thought that I had with that too is that these, um, the, the, a lot of these livestock, especially with soil tra tracking capabilities could be, um, potentially even used for, um, um, 
crop systems in which um, livestock is integrated. Um, and um, that could be a really extra added element to some of these tools, um, particularly with um, tracking soil benefits from integrating livestock. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's the, um, Hannah, you're, you're spot on. So, and, and we kind of realized that in the early days of creating this and we realized that, you know, animals are in herds or in, in bunches and things like that. And the ability to group those together and then, you know, um, show what you're doing with them, whether that's moving them from one pasture to another and what, what's in that pasture, whether it's crops or, or just a grazing field or whatever. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's, um, it, it, we think it's gonna be highly valuable <laughs> and insightful. Yes, this is a good conversation. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. So I wanted to ask, I know we heard from kind of Curly on Next Steps and it sounds like you already got a couple orders maybe even from this presentation today. So awesome on that. Um, I wanted to hear from Kyle because I know you, you just want to save people digging time. So any any next steps for, for your innovation? Oh, I'm hoping somebody watch this video. I'm going to be driving down the road and see see this you know brace post on the side of the road someplace someday. Um, but no, I, there's no real uh, way to, to turn this into some, uh, you know, business enterprise other than building fence for other people. My, my dream for a long time has been to get more research on, um, the wildlife benefits of minimal electric fencing, as opposed to, you know, really expensive cross fencing. So I've been bugging Hopland Field Station for a while after they burned down that they should not accept the insurance money and not rebuild a bunch of mesh fence. So my next step is to continue to try and to at least have a few of those paddocks because they've got collars on deer. Um, one of my next steps is to get some collars on the elk on our place. And um, I personally think that you could actually see fencing quality on uh, you know GPS migratory elk data. And it would be really simple. Like if it was a bad fence, you'd see a line and then a straight line to the side and then another line that would be squiggly. But if you just see like a continuous squiggly line, then you know you're doing a good job. And I'd like to tear out as much, you know, wildlife problematic fencing in this country as possible and put up stuff that, that they don't notice. So thank you, New Zealand. Thank you, Australia. You guys have been doing, uh, you know, electric fencing for a long time. It's time for the U.S. to, to, to pick up the game. That's awesome, Kyle. Thank you for sharing that. And I know there's, you know, potential opportunities for maybe graduate students or other groups to take that on through like a grant. The SARE grant program was just dropped by Lori. It sounds like that's a possible research project and something that could maybe happen. <laughs> Looking at Hannah too, <laughs> UC Davis community. Who's going to jump on that? <laughs> awesome. All right, well, we are at time. So I just have one more slide just to wrap things up. Oops, this is an old slide, apologize for that. Um, but yes, just thank you everyone for attending today. We have CAF's mailing list um, for those of you who aren't on it um, and stay tuned for details on next year's innovation challenge. We will be opening that portal um, later this summer for, for the next round of innovations. Um, so looking forward to that, and we hope everyone enjoys the conference as well and has a great evening. And this concludes our, our Innovation Challenge Award Ceremony. So thank you, everyone, again. Yay.